And the second panel, what we're going to be talking about today is something a bit more, maybe a bit more modern or a bit more abstract from the more conventional terrorism that we've been talking about earlier and the tactics of it and the um, ways of combating extremism. So the second panel is looking mostly at the differences, the similarities, and how can we tackle online and offline terrorism, not as, per se, separate phenomenons, but uh, two sides more of the same coin. Um, conventional wisdom suggesting that the internet and social media play a significant role in mobilizing individuals to become terrorist actors. Uh, this session and panels can explore the dynamics of internet radicalization, so to speak, um, its limits, how the online sphere affects the offline, how the offline sphere affects the online, perhaps in, uh, recruitment and other measures, as well as real world social groups. Um, so we have a really excellent panel of speakers. Um, all the panels are excellent, but this one is particularly good. Uh, we have Dr. Peter Newman, who's a special representative from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. He is still the director of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization at the uh, King's College in London. Uh, Professor Newman uh, is his latest book in English has been Radicalized, New Jihadists and the Threat Against the West. Uh, he's led quite a few research projects, written influential policy reports. His focus is on the crime terror nexus, um, which is something I think we're going to be talking about later on today as well. Um, and he's joined today by one of his colleagues as well, Dr. Shiraz Maher, who's the deputy director of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization, as well as a, member and facu a faculty member of the War Studies Department at King's College. Uh, Dr. Shiraz, perhaps most known at the moment for his book, Salafi Jihadism, The History of an Idea, which is a, a groundbreaking exploration of the political philosophy behind contemporary jihadist organizations. And of course, Dr. Shiraz got most of his information and his expertise in this field from actually conducting fieldwork across the, the current environments where these groups are active. He's, he's interviewed members of the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra, Ahrar al-Sham, as well as the Free Syrian Army. And more recently, Dr. Shiraz had conducted interviews with over 100 foreign fighters in Syria and Iraq. So his presence today is particularly useful and welcome. Um, Mr. George Salama is the head of public policy and government regulations for the Middle East and North Africa at Twitter, um, which is very great since we're talking about online and offline terrorism and extremism. Uh, Mr. George. Uh, particularly works in strategic engagement with key governments, political figures, policymakers, regulators, lawmakers, and media representatives across the Middle East, um, as well as he works with them in this developing public policy solutions that meet the needs of uh, not just the interests of the governments that are working in the region, but as well as the Twitter users is his first and foremost concern. So looking at this context where online social media as corporations with concerns in the offline world, coordinating with uh, governments and policymakers in the region will be a particularly useful point of view, I think. And prior to Twitter, of course, Mr. George has much experience in telecommunications, uh, particularly seven years at the National Telecommunication Regulation Authority in Egypt. And uh, finally, we have one of the center's own, uh, Ms. Samaya Fatani, who is a researcher in gender studies in the Contemporary Political Thought Unit at the King Faisal Center for Research, us. Uh, focusing on gender and terrorism, especially in the Arab world and Arab women's membership in and recruitment by terrorist organizations, as well as gender dynamics of family, marriage, and gender roles in uh, terrorist organizations. So what we're going to do, I think, is probably the best way. We'll have each speaker give their small opening remarks. Then we'll open it up to this, uh, the panelists to have a discussion amongst themselves. I'll probably ask them questions after all of their presentations have been made. And then we'll open it up to the audience for anyone who has questions. Um, we've been a bit behind time this morning, so we'd like to try to catch up time in this panel. The speakers have agreed to make concrete, specific, um, not necessarily short, but basically short opening remarks, a quick discussion, and then hopefully some audience participation. So we'll start with Dr. Shiraz. Would you like to start? Sure. It's Thank it's you. Fun. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Your Royal Highness, uh, the Coalition, Dr. Saud, for uh, making the uh, conference possible and more generally for hosting me in Riyadh as well. 
uh, over the last four months where, while, whilst I've been here. Um, I'll just make four quick uh, remarks or observations uh, about uh, the broad issues that Faisal was outlining, the online, offline interaction, uh, and then uh, stop there in order to uh, give my co-panelists an opportunity and to uh, allow for questions from the audience. The thing that uh, has really struck me in some of the work that we've been doing back at King's College and looking at the way um, people are using the internet, engaging with the internet, uh, is that this is a rapidly moving and fast-changing environment. And, and as a result of that, uh, we're seeing a sort of series of new dynamics. That old distinction, the old discourse of there being an online and offline realm is increasingly breaking down. We've seen uh, the introduction of technologies now, smartphones, tablets, these kinds of devices that have really brought the internet into our online, uh, sort of, a, sorry, our daily lives sort of consistently and constantly. That distinction of going online doesn't really exist anymore. We are sort of constantly plugged into these much broader uh, uh, networks, into our social media, into news cycles, in a way that we previously just weren't. What that's presented uh, terrorist movements an opportunity to do, particularly movements like Daesh, and I think Daesh understood uh, Twitter in particular better than anybody else and cottoned onto it far better, is that it gives them the ability to produce uh, material and propaganda that is rapid, that is uh, sensitive to the needs of their audience, and they really had an ability to connect with people in this way um, that sort of plugs into what might be called the Twitter generation. So if you look at old propaganda, and that's something I've been quite interested in, is looking at uh, the, the types of material, for example, that Al-Qaeda was producing in the aftermath of September the 11th. There was still an emphasis by that movement on producing booklets, on producing PDF files that were released onto the internet and then were downloaded and consumed and read by their um, supporters and, and, and so on. And that principally came through uh, online chat forums which were typically password restricted. So there were already barriers to entry to access uh, some of that material. Then for a while, and the situation is changing now, but for a while at least, um, this type of stuff became very rapidly available on mainstream social media platforms, in particular Twitter and Facebook. And what Daesh understood was that, in fact, young people don't want to download uh, 30-page booklet uh, uh, about what's happening in Syria or Iraq. They want a quick infographic, a quick uh, uh, picture or uh, a bite-sized piece of information that can be consumed, digested very, very quickly. And so that gave them the ability to present this kind of quite polarized binary distinction to young people, which really fed into their narrative, fed into the stories. Here is option A, here is option B. It preys on emotion, so it's, it's really simplifying the message in a way um, that is designed to appeal to people and designed to uh, agitate and excite them uh, in order to move towards its message. What we then found, and this is my, my third point uh, in some of the work that we were doing, was that, of course, millions of people are consuming this information all the time. There's a torrent of information available to any one of us at any moment in time. So, the audience is large, and the consumption of that material is quite large, yet we don't see everyone, of course, mobilized who consumes that. So where is the tipping point? What determines and deciphers how an individual consumes this content and then finally mobilizes into becoming an actual terrorist, making the decision, for example, to travel to a theater of conflict, such as Syria and Iraq and so on? What we found was that in this context, offline interaction still mattered uh, incredibly, uh, and that having an offline connection, having a social network that you interact with in the real world, knowing people who had already traveled, more often than not, proved to be the decisive tipping point between you going. So in essence, you're more likely to go, you're more likely to mobilize or to enter uh, a terrorist network if you already know people who are there, or you are socializing uh, in an offline environment with people who are of a like mind and who are similarly inclined uh, uh, to move in that same way. And we mapped out uh, uh, as, a, as a unit at, at ICSR, myself, Peter, and, and other colleagues who are here, uh, looking at the patterns of migration for British fighters, German fighters, French fighters, Scandinavians. And time and time again, we saw these patterns. They knew each other from high school. They lived within the same streets of one another. They hung out at the same youth centers and then mobilized and went in that way. And I'll just stop with, with, my, with my fourth uh, point uh, before handing uh, back to Faisal, which is 
the challenges presented by social media, by the ubiquity of the internet, by the sort of increasing digitization of our lives, I think uh, will increase the pressures of radicalization on all of us as time goes on. Our societies are changing, they are uh, adapting to new technological changes all the time. And as we see increasing automation come about as a result of some of this as well, just to give a sort of uh, contemporary and slightly esoteric example, but for example, we've seen a lot of um, stuff about automated cars, self-driving cars coming out from Google. It's not inconceivable that soon you will have self-driving vehicles that come that displace all kinds of people from tr uh, tr their traditional jobs in logistics drivers, for truck drivers, for taxi drivers, and so on. And so as we've had technological revolutions in the past, people moving from the countryside to the city, moving from sort of uh, working in industries and factories into service economies, as the next wave of this technological revolution comes into place, you will find, again, large numbers of people being displaced from what they know, being displaced from what they regard as their tr sort of traditional uh, workspaces, and so on. And as a result of that, Social pressures, tensions increase. We see that in particular, of course, in Europe and the West, but it's uh, something that is a global uh, phenomenon. And as those pressures increase on societies, of course, that is precisely the type of environment, precisely the type of tension that terrorist movements look to exploit and use in order to mobilize people to their cause. So I just wanted to throw out a few bite-sized uh, ideas for, for the uh, discussion. And Faisal, I'll, I'll pass over back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Shiraz. And I was just reminded that actually, ironically, perhaps, since we're in this social media and this online panel, we do actually have a hashtag for this, <laughs> for this panel. And that is hashtag RFCEFT, standing for Riyadh Forum on Combating Extremism and Fighting Terrorism. Um, so on that note, back to subject matter at hand, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Dr. Professor Peter, Professor Peter Newman. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, thank you, Your Royal Highness, uh, Dr. Saud, and the King Faisal Center for having me here. Um, I'm currently OSCE Special Representative on Countering Violent Extremism. That means I'm traveling to a lot of country, countries to learn about their experiences, their approaches in countering violent extremism. And the idea is really to identify best practices in countries with lots of experience and to match them up with countries that don't have that experience but could benefit from building up that, cap that capacity. However, what I'm saying now is not in that capacity, it is in my capacity as a colleague of Shiraz and as a professor at King's College London on the issue of online radicalization. And based on the research that we have done at my institute over the past five years, let me make three quick points that are also expanding on what Shiraz just said. The first point is that very few people get recruited exclusively through the internet, at least not in Europe. Across Europe, if you look at what towns and cities people have gone from in order to join Daesh in Syria and Iraq, you see clusters, clusters in small towns, in Portsmouth, Cardiff, Brighton in Britain, in Dienstlach, in Zoling, in Wolfsburg in Germany. And if this was entirely about the internet, that wouldn't make any sense at all, because the internet is everywhere. The reality is these clusters exist because they consist in many cases of 20, 30 people that have known each other for a very long time. They went to high school together. They played football with each other. And what convinced them to go in the end was that they knew someone who had already gone and that they had trust, they had confidence, and they had affection for someone that they knew. In the case of Norway, for example, 50% of the people who went from Norway to Syria and Iraq not only came from the same city, they came from the same street of the same city. These are clusters that do not emerge by accident. They emerge because people have known each other face to face for a very long time. And of course, this is being amplified by the internet, but the internet is not the exclusive reason as to why these people are going. The second point that I want to make is that everything I've just said 
doesn't make the internet unimportant. What online propaganda by organizations like Daesh has done was to build the brand that is Daesh. This alone may not have been sufficient in convincing people to go, but it, it certainly helped to create a desire. It made it, in the case of Daesh, more attractive to travel to the self-declared caliphate. And that was certainly the case after mid-2014. The videos that Daesh posted, they communicated strength, power, success, domination, violence. But they also communicated camaraderie, belonging, acceptance, being part of something that was truly historical. And it therefore amplified people's desire to be part of that project. It allowed people to become a hero in next to no time. And this was not only true for the official videos that Daesh put out, it was also true for the thousands of pictures that, that fighters themselves posted on mainstream platforms. So the explanation why Daesh was perhaps more successful than other groups in being the first group of choice for many of these people lies at least in part in the sophistication, in the clarity, the strategic vision with which they articulated um, their narrative. And the third and final point is that in addition to saying that recruitment is typically based on face-to-face -face relationships and the internet does matter in terms of building the brand, the final point is that the role of the internet, as Shiraz pointed out, is changing. In 2014, Lots of these fighters were on mainstream platforms, on Twitter, on Facebook. This is no longer the case. Facebook and Twitter have closed down thousands and thousands of accounts. And this has not made them go away. Instead, they have migrated to other, perhaps darker corners of the internet. So the sort of communities that you used to find on Twitter and Facebook, you now find in private messaging services like Telegram, Viber, or WhatsApp. The phenomenon has become a different one. 2014, metaphorically speaking, these people were playing in front of a big audience. They were playing in Madison Square Garden. Today, they are playing in front of friends and family. And many of you will probably agree that that is a good thing. The ability to reach out to people is limited. But the platforms they are using are also a lot more intimate. They are private and therefore difficult to access. It has become more difficult for law enforcement, for intelligence agencies to follow these people online because a lot of these applications are end-to-end -end encrypted. And it has become very difficult for authorities to find out what is happening. And this has prompted a new tactic that we have seen used for almost 18 months now. The so-called remote controlled attack, whereby people get instructions via private messaging services like Telegram and WhatsApp, and are carrying out attacks led by a virtual mentor sitting in a place like Raqqa, and they are following these instructions, like for example last summer in Germany, where two of the attackers, two, two of the attacks were carried out and led by people who were sitting in Syria. So the phenomenon is changing. Let me conclude by saying that the internet is of course a fact of life. Extremism online is a fact of life. It will not be possible to eliminate it altogether. The second point, the second conclusion is that every action has consequences. If you chase extremists off mainstream platforms, they will go to talk to darker corners of the internet and they will be active there. They will not go away altogether. I'm not saying that is necessarily a bad thing, but the idea that you can eliminate extremism from online altogether, I think is an illusion. And that's why, and that's my very final point, I think countering extremism online shouldn't be exclusively about taking stuff online. That's one part of the solution. It's an important part of the solution. But we also have to use the internet as an opportunity to follow people, to find out what they are doing, 
and to also identify vulnerable people online and engage in challenging and challenge them before the extremists are doing that. And I know, of course, that Saudi is doing that in an extensive way. So my message would be the extremists, uh, the, the internet is, of course, a challenge, but it is also an opportunity and it is not likely to go away. So let's have a constructive dialogue about how we can use the internet for our purposes rather than leaving it to the extremists. Thank you, Thank you Professor Peter. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Mr. George from Twitter. Maybe not a response, but a, uh, an other side view on uh, this interaction and what governments can do, policymakers can do, as well as what online social media corporations are doing regarding this matter. Well, uh, uh, first, it's a pleasure and honor being here, uh, Your Royal Highness, and thanks to the uh, uh, Center of King Faisal for the kind invitation. And uh, frankly, I will try to make my intervention as short as 140 characters, like a tweet. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was listening carefully to the previous speakers, and uh, I couldn't agree more with, with, with what Professor Peter just mentioned, that... Uh, the internet cannot be blamed on, on uh, the uh, violent extremism, extremism that we are uh, uh, all witnessing in, uh, today. But le le let me give you quickly, from, from our perspective as Twitter, well, as you all know, Twitter is, is, is a platform where people go first to understand and to know what's happening in the world. So this is where news are breaking. And maybe this sort of character for the last uh, a few years make it a sort of a platform that people can interact and get engaged in this sort of conversations. But uh, our efforts in, in, in cooperation with not only with not only with government entities, but it's, uh, it's, it's a multi-stakeholder uh, dialogue that we are having with, with uh, governments, with uh, uh, research centers, uh, and uh, with civil society, just to help uh, our users uh, to feel much more safer on the platform. So on, on the CVE front specifically, we, we recently announced that, uh, uh, and this was in, in, in March, that we, we suspended uh, more than 600,000 accounts for uh, terrorist uh, uh, organizations who are promoting terrorism content on our platform. But le 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 let's be frank, because account suspension is not the, the final solution to the uh, CVE challenge. And this means that uh, uh, account suspension is, is, is helping on one end, but at the same time we are working in cooperation with, uh, like I stated earlier, with different stakeholders and government authorities. Uh, at the same time, there is like um, an important point that need to be mentioned because working in, 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 in a close relationship with different government entity and security agency, at the same time we as a platform, uh, transparency uh, is, is part of our DNA. And that's why we are issuing twice a year our government transparency report, where you can find in specific all the requests received and how we uh, uh, cooperated with the different government. So this is in, in, in a nutshell how we are uh, tackling the issue of, of violent extremism, both in, in two ways, account suspension, of any account who is promoting any sort of action. We condemn the use of our platform to promote any sort of violent threat or terrorism. And at the same time, we are helping in uh, 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 dealing and relationship building with the different stakeholders who are working on that front. I, will, I would like to conclude my intervention saying that we are, we are in front of a global societal uh, uh, issue. And uh, to be frank, there is no technology, as of we are speaking now, will be able to solve it. So, uh, uh, and I, I am always saying that the long-term solution to fight extremism starts from the foundation. The tallest building on this planet has the deepest, the deepest foundation ever. So we need to start by our kids to work 
in cooperation with Ministry of Education, with schools, with parents at home, just to make sure that we have the right generation coming up in, in, in a fruitful, healthier environment that won't be easy be, uh, attracted to any sort of extremism ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. George. And uh, finally, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Samaya. Is it open? Well, following Professor, Professor Newman's remarks, I'd also like to talk about what the online means to extremists uh, or self-identified jihadists in this era, especially from a sociological perspective. So while um, places such as Daesh is usually perceived as a utopia for many individuals, the contrast in their writings show that non-belonging in their own societies mean what, what it means to, their, uh, to them. So actions of distancing from the other becomes more and more apparent. With distancing and before taking up the decision to migrate, there comes a phase of finding safe spaces where their identities and thoughts are shared safely with others who agree with them. Non-belonging can be understood in two different ways. The first is to be socially excluded from society for, one, for one's background, whether sectarian, ethnic, um, class, or even social behavior. And the second, on the other hand, is to be deta detached from society due to feeling morally or intellectually superior uh, to societies they live, which they designate as unfit. The latter is not unlike Sayyid al Qutb's writing on in, uh, emotional isolationism, al Uzl al Shuriya, that was a concept recycled amongst jihadist organizations. So we, ask, so we ask the question to what extent can one be physically separated from society while, it's being, phys uh, while being also present? emotionally present. Non-belonging, uh, emphasized by concepts of isolationism, can be a catalyst for one's hijra. But most importantly, this form of social disassociation makes the cyberspace a safe space, where individuals alike feel secure to, feel, to think freely. The online created a virtual life for them to fulfill a fantasy that they have long been dreaming uh, without having experienced the pain to leave their families uh, and lives back home. So my study focuses on the discourses used online platforms and analyzed the Daesh recruitment strategies used to attract specifically women from various uh, social and geographic backgrounds through Daesh media platforms. It's argued that while Arabic uh, texts tend to employ a more theological rhetoric, English and Francophone texts tend to employ a rhetoric emphasizing social inclusivity as means to attract American and European or Western women to join Daesh. So Daesh propagandists have advocated for a range of themes to run through its messaging schemes that can potentially maximize and sustain its appeal to different demographics of active supporters. Daesh propaganda strategically modify, modified discourses in order to accommodate to different motiva motivations. So emphasis vary between nods towards religious legitimacy, i.e. Daesh as a, khil a khilafah, to an emphasis on resistance, i.e. as an heir to the revolutionary movements of eras past. So what do Arabic discourses tell us? The Al Khansa Manifesto, for example, published in Arabic in early 2015, has not been officially translated by Daesh in English, despite their clear capacity to do so. So grievances presented and embraced by Daesh recruitment uh, material for Arabic-speaking audiences are often focused on acclaimed unauthentic applications of Islam in Arab and Muslim states. Daesh material describes in Arabic their utop utopian state subsequently within the framework of religious revival and victory. Uh, that because of religious illiteracy and as a consequence the corruption of both Isla uh, of, uh, sorry, of Islam both ideologically and physically in the Arab and Muslim world. Interesting as well is the discourse of belonging used specifically to address literate women in Arabic speaking societies emphasizes the infamous heroines of the prophetic era, addressing potential recruitees as the descendant of Umm Imara, for example, or the granddaughters of uh, Khadija. Uh, in alluding to a link between such hero heroines of prophetic era symbol, symbols, uh, uh, female piety and courage, Daesh recruiters 
attempt to sway women in their Arabic language material, claiming that they are descendants from the heroines of prophetic era, culturally and religiously, reinforcing a sense of belonging and duty towards an Islam seen as on the way. As for the English discourses or the Francophone languages, and unsimilar to the uh, Arabic ones, such a, sense, such a sense of belonging is presented as responsibility rather than an offering. Belonging in English discourses takes the form of offering the present khilafa as a common global solution to the issues of non-belonging faced by female supporters of Daesh in the West. So many groups of Muslim, European, and North American women are said to suffer from isolation and social exclusivity, as integration in society is seen as a superficial and abstract one. The, pro the projection of Islamophobia, not just as an ideology, but as a form of social anxiety, further fortifies the challenges presented to social cohesion and citizenship in their countries. Once identified in, as grievances, this can and is exploited in the recruitment process Daesh uh, of ex socially excluded uh, members, especially women and youth in, in, in Europe and North America. So Daesh recruiters attempt to attract women by offering an accommodating solution to their perceived, perceived identity crisis through the online space. Assembled grievances are gendered in order to appeal to women where social inclusivity as well as authenticity in faith are presented as and framed as issues specifically relevant to women, rendering it unsurprising that the politicization of language is employed to appeal to women of the West as well as uh, women of the Arab world. The divergences of discourses used is a, is a manifestation of Daesh's investment to recruit women, which also highlights their realization to women's crucial role in their organization as it's, as it's being in a nation building phase. I'd like to conclude by reiterating on the point that discourses differ to grievances grouped to different women, where I leave you to the question, what discourses do we have to offer to counter such discourses? Thank you. Thank you. You know, this side is better. Thank you, Samaya. This side is better. Um, so I found it really interesting, and maybe a bit. Let's just stick with interesting. I think it's really interesting that in this panel where we're talking about online and offline terrorism and extremism, um, in this perhaps like virtual world where things are, you know, maybe the opposite of real is virtual, and in, in this online space, I found it really interesting that we're hearing, especially from Samaya's presentation, the the human factor, the human side of these extremists, of individuals attracted to extremist groups coming through. And uh, Shiraz spoke earlier of um, an increasingly binary, correct, an increasingly binary rhetoric coming from, uh, from the extremist groups and from the jihadist groups and themselves. But listening this morning as well, I think sometimes we, or as practitioners and experts in studying extremist groups and ideologies, we tend to also categorize as you know, state, non-state, uh, good people or criminals, or we hear that the people, these terrorists and these extremists often have criminal backgrounds. But removing ourselves from these also, what I think we can call binary labels, uh, we're starting to see some more, I think, especially in Professor Peter and Samaya's presentations, um, we're starting to see emerge more nuanced contextual situations that are attracting individuals into these situations. So I just kind of have two vague questions or talking points, and I'll turn it over to the speakers to, to debate amongst themselves. But, um, you know, Samaya mentioned differences in rhetorics and recruitment between um, the Muslim or the Arabic-speaking world and recruitment amongst Western foreign fighters. Um, and I think we, as both societies, you know, we might have differing reasons why our youths are attracted to these extremist ideologies, but at the end of the day, they are. And I think two conundrums that we each face, um, one of the conundrums for the West, and I think that maybe George and Professor Newman can talk about this more, is it's a debate that you often have. How do we you know, approach these online phenomena without you know, countering these core Western values that the West has about privacy and about uh, freedom of speech and about transparency, as George was mentioning? So, that's not so unlike the conundrum that we face also here in the Middle East. You know, these, these are extremists, these are terrorists, but they're from our society and there's clearly social woes. And I think that both groups, both this explanation of how to address 
the, the issues of core Western values, or in our case, how to address these issues of you know, these core human values of our fellow citizens, of our fellow Muslims, our fellow Arabs, how can we more contextualize and in a more nuanced way uh, you know, tackle these issues of online and offline, of extremism, or of terrorism in general, without just looking at these you know, hard security policies, which are, to an extent, just as binary and perhaps not as effective as we've seen over the past two decades? Anybody from the panel? So, okay. So that's, of course, uh, the one million dollar question in many respects. And uh, I would say that when it comes to, um, when it comes to, the, to, to the question of taking down content, it's not actually as difficult as it seems. Because even in Western countries, and I'm, I'm accepting the United States for one, for one second, but in most Western European countries, you do have extensive legislation uh, against hate speech, against incitement to violence, against all the things that uh, perhaps are happening online, but these laws have not been applied con consistently to the online environment. On top of that, of course, all the mainstream online platforms, such as, for example, Facebook, have so-called community standards mm -hmm. in which they articulate that they will not tolerate incitement to violence within their own platforms. So the law is on our side. If we want to take down content, even within the context of Western values, that is already possible. What I'm trying to argue is that even if those standards are being applied consistently, that will not be sufficient because a lot of the content may not actually fall under any of these laws. And what you need to do in the online environment as well as in the offline environment, in addition to taking down content, you need to engage people before extremists are doing that. And what we're only starting to understand is that the online environment is a place just like any other place. So if I go into a community in the suburbs of Paris, for example, and I'm trying to find people who may be vulnerable to the narratives of violent extremists, I would hope that one day there will be people online who are doing more or less the same things, identifying vulnerable people and trying to engage them in dialogue. These two spheres may be different in the sense that one is virtual and one is not, but they don't function according, necessarily according to a different logic. Radicalization is ultimately about two things. This is a really important point because in the political debate, people always get this wrong. In a Western context, when you speak to people who are on the left end of the political spectrum, they always talk about frustrations and grievances, poverty, education, all these things. If you talk to people on the right end of the political spectrum, they talk about ideology, and you have to counter the evil ideology. The reality is, of course, and all the empirical evidence is showing, that it is, in fact, both of it. It is a frustration that opens you up, that gives you what scientists call a cognitive opening, and then you have an ideology that resonates with the grievance, that makes sense of the frustration and channels it into a particular political project. If you're a policymaker, you need to work on both fronts. You need to fight the causes of extremism. You need to give a perspective to young people in Western Europe who do not feel they belong to society, who feel discriminated against. But at the same time, you also have to counter the ideology that seeks to get these people and channel them into the direction of an extremist narrative. That has to happen offline, that also has to happen online, and I wish we were not just sitting at conferences talking about this, but actually starting to do it in practice. I don't want to pick on you, Professor Peter, but yeah. you are the, can I move this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you are the, you're the, the token European of the panel, yes. so I'm just going to follow up really quickly. Um, because we're talking about you know, offline situations that I, I really agree with what you were saying. It kind of goes along the lines with the Olivier Roy talks that someone was mentioning earlier. There are situations, there are real life situations of poverty, of frustrations 
that are leading people to be open to these ideologies that exist, whether or not. Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. What are we doing to, you know, maybe preemptively stop people from being attracted to these or not be easily distracted by these, um, these ideologies or not be attracted to these ideologies? I think you can see here in Saudi, we've been having now with some of these big plans of, you know, Vision 2030 and whatnot, aside from the economic ideas of the vision, there are actual things happening to provide frustrated or anyone, to provide youth with attractive things that will keep them busy and keep them perhaps employed, or keep them perhaps entertained uh, outside of these ideologies. But ironically, I think what we can see in Europe and in the West in general is a much more securitized type of national security approach that's just looking at dealing with these issues as a phenomenon, not per se dealing with why people are attracted to these in the first place. Mm -hmm. So and I think, what do you think of that? Yes. <laughs> I tend to agree with you. Uh, I tend to agree with you. And I think it's, uh, it's incredibly important uh, that in, in Europe we're working towards a situation. It's not, in fact, as easy as saying it's poverty or lack of economic opportunities. I always, you know, obviously there's empirical data that shows, yes, a lot of people with no economic perspectives have become attracted to Daesh, but there are also people who have had decent prospects who have gone down, gone down that road. I would argue, I would hypothesize, and please contradict me if I'm wrong, the one thing they all share, at least the Europeans, is that they don't feel that they belong into European society. There are people in France, and I'm, don't worry, I'm not only picking on France, the same situation exists in almost every Western European country. There are people in France who were born in France, who grew up in France, who speak French, who went to French schools, had a French education, live in France, yet they st still don't feel that they are part of France. They still know that if they send a job application and their name is Mohammed, it has, a, it has more of a chance of being rejected than any other persons. So the solution is at the same time very simple and very complex. The solution is number one, European societies have to define very clearly what it is that they want young people to stick to. What are the laws, what are the social norms that, that constitutes France and being French? But at the same time, if people adhere to these norms and adhere to these laws, they have to be fully accepted as French. There is no excuse if Mohammed grows up in France, has a French passport, accepts the laws and lives by the social norms of the French Republic, society has to accept him as French. Only that way you can create true resistance and resilience against the jihadist narrative, which is trying to tell these young people, you don't belong, join us, because we are offering you a true home. Only if, if we as European societies offer a true home to everyone who accepts our ideas, then the problem will start to go away. Can I just build on, sorry? You want to pick up on that? Yeah, I just want to pick up very quickly on Peter's point, uh, not least because we, we regularly sort of discuss this, but what Peter was saying about the point about branding was really important in that context, because it fits in uh, with all of this, and, and to bring it back to, to what we were discussing before with the social media platforms, again, you saw an alphabet soup of different groups on the ground in Syria and Iraq. So Daesh was just one of many groups. You mentioned uh, before, you know, Jabhat al-Nusra, Ahrar al-Sham, various other movements all operating. But how did Daesh pull away so quickly? Because it understood the ability to not just uh, use this and harness this uh, technology that was available to it, but it created a branding. It looked like an army. It created a narrative, a slogan around the movements. I think it's the first time you've ever had, really, a, a movement like this emerge that had its own strap line, like a marketing campaign, Bakia mm -hmm. wa right? And so this thing that all their supporters were chanting that they were buying into was part of something bigger. It was a narrative of success. It was a narrative of momentum. It was a narrative of dominance on the ground. And that meant that if I was a young person traveling to the region, looking to select between various groups, I want to be part of the winning team. Everyone wants to be part of the winning team. And at that point, Daesh had that ability to uh, project uh, that success, coupled with 
uh, uh, its slick messaging, uh, uh, and so on. And Peter's point is really important in that context, that if we are trying to look at sort of counter-narratives, trying to look uh, against this, it's interesting because the whole discourse is saying, what's the counter-narrative to Daesh? But shouldn't Daesh really be looking at us, saying, what's the counter-narrative to the success story of a young Muslim in France, in Britain, in Saudi, in any of these countries? Because ultimately, they're our citizens. They've grown up in our societies, and they've opted out to travel to this place and to uh, engage in something that's completely different uh, uh, and, and shedding and rejecting where they've come from. So really, the fight should be taken to them in that context, that they should be the ones saying, what's the counter-narrative to being a young Muslim from X, Y, Z? Not us saying, what's the counter-narrative to being a member of Daesh? Mm. Mm. Do you guys have anything? Did you guys? Um, I understand. Did you, have it? Did you want to talk about this topic? Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm just having like one quick comment, sure. maybe if we can keep it to the end, but uh, on that same point, let me let, let me tell you that for, uh, we at Twitter, for example, when we, when we are talking about uh, uh, our policies and uh, terms of services, we are a global platform, and we are talking about a global problem where no one size fits all solution. So this actually put us like in front of some challenges, and that's why we, as uh, uh, as a policy team at uh, Twitter, we have. Uh, 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 different uh, uh, approaches in that can be used in a different uh, uh, region and different uh, countries based on the current situation. And uh, uh, having our terms are, and, and terms of services and rules uh, public, uh, and the challenge that that those terms uh, of services can fit any sort of abuse or. Uh, uh, hate speech or terrorist content on our platform make it uh, uh, a big success for, for a global uh, platform. And that's why we are here today. We are here uh, today to understand and to share our experience from what we are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. More than 500 million tweets per day. Can you imagine the amount of content that we, even if we applied the most advanced machine learning software to detect any sort of content, we will still be uh, uh, in a deep need of our community and our people and our users to report whatever content that they see inappropriate. We, we have done lots of investment in, 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 in enlarging our teams, bringing in Arabic speakers, uh, 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 team members to be able to digest this sort of reported content and be able to take immediate uh, response. We have changed our approach uh, uh, when we are dealing with uh, with safety. We we have safety as a top number one top priority for for, for us at Twitter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salam. I understand that, uh, Mr. Fritini, you have a a question, Your Excellency. No. no. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I, I have to um, say that um, I, I agree with what the panelists said. Um, talking about particularly to the uh, European uh, situation, uh, you know, there has been a growing and increasing cooperation on how to, on one hand, detect and uh, cut some dangerous link using internet to disseminate hatred and messages, including operational messages. You know, how to make a bomb is very easy to find on internet website. On the other hand, on prevention. Uh, I would like uh, particularly to ask uh, Professor Neumann, who is uh, working for OECE, who is uh, making a really uh, commendable activity on prevention side. Is, in your view, Professor, enough? The strategy of prevention through counter messages, through education, through civic education, because you mentioned uh, a very much important point about how to prevent 
young people from radicalizing. I remember myself as former commissioner during the time of uprisings in the banlieue. I went to Lyon, I went to Paris, and those people felt completely excluded. And what you said about the feeling not to be a citizen of France is, in your view, properly countered through a proper civic education policy. I think this is one of the weak points for our Europe today. So I think it's, of course, not enough. Um, I think it's one of the components of a holistic prevention approach. I think education is very important. I think there are parts in Europe, uh, parts of Europe, uh, let's say in the banlieues of Paris or in Molenbeek in Brussels, where the state has to engage again. Where the state has, for a very long time, basically abandoned these areas. And it has to engage in different ways. It has to engage, for example, through community policing. A lot of these areas have not seen a consistent presence of the police. But it also has to engage, for example, through creating opportunities for young people, youth work, social work, giving them opportunities, entertaining them, as you said, somewhat casually, giving them opportunities to do something with their lives. They are, I think I'm taking it a little bit too far, but they are essentially, we have for far too long tolerated essentially ungoverned territories in the middle of our countries. We have to re-engage these places. I think prevention also, for example, means intervention. When you detect signs and indicators of radicalization, in more and more countries, we have specialized intervention teams that help these young people stop going down the road of extremism, that offer them a way out. Some people call it de-radicalization, some people call it disengagement. It is not necessarily about punishing people, it is about offering them an opportunity out before they do something criminal. And of course, it also means, for example, going into environments like prisons. I've traveled in my capacity as OSCE Special Representative to a lot of countries in Central Asia, for example, also in the Balkans, where no work at all is being done in the prisons. We're now faced with a situation where more and more of these fighters will return to our countries. More and more convictions will take place. Our prisons will fill up with people who have been convicted of terrorism-related offenses. Yet in many countries, there's no plan, there's no strategy, there's not even any thinking about what to do with people once they enter the prison system. And in the next panel, we will hear about the crime terror nexus. What happens if you have convicted terrorists in the same environment with organized criminals? That again creates opportunities to further radicalization. We have to think more systematically about all of these issues. Education is just one of them. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Yes, the gentleman here in the front. Uh, my name is Mohammed, Ambassador Mohammed Nohli. I would like just Professor Newman, he just mentioned about uh, the radicalization in France. France is a bit different than other countries because the French system doesn't stop to provoke the Muslim people. They keep provocating them. Last year, a lot of mayors of some provinces, they insisted not to have an alternative meal for uh, uh, pupils in the uh, public schools. They used to have once a week uh, to have pork, and they have an alternative meal. But they said this is against uh, the value of the republic. And this provocation of people, because mainly people who went to, who goes to the public school, they are poor people. So either they uh, they will not eat, or they will be they will eat, and they will feel humiliated. And this what the people they don't really realize how by provocating people, how by not respecting them. Uh, because it is not an issue to be raised, you know, about uh, a meal in, in a primary school, public school. And this, I think also it is very important to have a holistic political uh, approach to be right about to address it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Faisal, you have a question? Yes. Where is Faisal? No, uh, one second, there's, uh, yes. 
فيصل 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 جربه يو هاف ا يس فيصل جربه بليز السلام عليكم السلام عليكم انا فيصل حروش الجربة من الموصل من محافظة نينوى ويسعدنا اليوم نحضر في هذا المؤتمر ونوصل بعض من الرأي لو أريد أن تكلم يراد لنا شهر يلا نعد جرائم داعش ولا نقدر نحصيها حنا نتكلم من أرض الحدث ليس من الإعلام أو أي شيء أنا من 2004 طلعت من العراق هو بسبب تهديش تهديد الإرهاب تهديد داعش في 2010 فجروا مسكني هذا في الموصل وكان يحتوي على أكبر مكتبة شخصية فيها أمهات الكتب ولا عندنا ذنب إلا أننا مخالفينهم مخالفين فكر الخوارج اللي وصفهم الرسول عليه الصلاة والسلام كلاب أهل النار ولا لهم علاج إلا الاستئصال القتل إن المحادثة وأنا أسمع الأخوان يقول إذا رجعوا نحاول نستقطبهم تستقطبهم على قتل الناس وعلى سفك دمانة وسفك دماء اليزيدية والنصارى والمسلمين وكل مكونات الشعب العراقي ما يخيفنا اليوم في الموصل أن بعض الناس اللي كانوا هم في العملية السياسية من قبل الإرهاب يحاول يرجعون وبعض اللي عليهم علامات إرهابية أعطوهم حشود وهذا شيء للمستقبل يخوف ألا أنتمناوا يكون وقفة واحدة واستئصالهم محاربتهم مثل ما المملكة العربية السعودية محاربتهم لو بعض وسائل الإعلام تحاول تصور الصورة عكس بس هو الحقيقة الدولة اللي مشخصتهم ومعرفتهم على منهجهم الخبيث هي المملكة العربية السعودية حنا الآن بالموصل عندنا المهجرين وعندنا الناس مشتتة وآلاف الضحايا بسبب الإرهاب وهو الإرهاب ما دخل علينا في 2014 هو من 2004 هو متمثل بالموصل أكثر الدوائر والمنظمات أو أكثر الدوائر الحكومية يدير جزء من الإرهاب لا حد يقدر يأخذ المقاولة إلا داعش يكون له حصة به هي كانت اسم القاعدة ولا أحد يقدر يعمل بالموصل إذا ما يكون حصة لهم أنا واحد من الناس طلعت من 2004 لأني ما رضخت لهم والفضل لله أنا حاليا مخول من قبل أبناء الضحايا يعني وكلوني عنهم لمواقفي وأنا والله مو أقول هذا الكلام أريد أبين نفسي قدامكم بس حنا إيدنا بالنار مو مثل اللي هو خارج مثل الأخونا الله يجزاه خير الأستاذ يقول ضروري نستقطبهم والله هذا الكلام يقف كل شخص لكم من الإرهاب الواجب استئصالهم ولا يكون لهم وجود وشكرا جزاكم الله خير وفقكم الله شكرا استاذ از يس بروفيسور اميدو اوكي ثانك يو فيري ماتش ويل اي جوست تو بوينتس ناو ذيس اون لاين اند اوف لاين ايشو اي ثينك وي نيد تو نوت ذات the young ones or the little ones, and I want to identify with uh, George Salama's idea that there is need for foundational education for the young ones so that they have the true knowledge about Islam and about social norms. That's number one. Because some of those ones who, these young suicide bombers, they have been radicalized because they have no access to the real truth, but of course, the alternative truth. Apology to the US. Secondly, this philosophy or idea of uh, 
containing Iran and I ISIS. And I think there's a problem there, and has, it has created a lot of problems all over the world. You know, in 1979, this Iranian revolution, for the first time in West Africa, you had a large number of Shias now coming on because they were fascinated by the Iranian revol Islamic revolution in the sense that it was anti-American, secondly, because it was not from an Arab country. And my suggestion is that the failed policy of uh, dealing with it, quote and unquote, should actually go to that of containment. So you are able to get things better done by containing Iran. And I think in the Islamic world, there used to be this word to call the terrible Madhahib. So you can never eliminate Shism in the same way as you can never eliminate terrorism. So I think we should try as much as possible to engage Iran rather than having a universal policy of uh, fighting or whatever. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Amedio. Uh, Dr. Najib Zaman. Thank you. My name is Najib al -Zamir, and my question will go to Mr. Peter Newman and to the young lady there, uh, Sumaya Fatani. Well, I, th I really thank you for focusing on those people who leave their countries behind and go to Syria from, from, from uh, different uh, Europe and American nations. But uh, I'm not yet really intensified. What puzzles me, really, why girls and women in Europe, in America, New Zealand, and Australia leave their comfort zone, comfort place, and their family behind, and throw themselves in a real inferno on earth? And what is really the attractiveness of Daesh? The other question is, or the other question is, why our scholars couldn't, couldn't achieve the same success. Thank you very much. Do you want to respond to me? Yeah, sure. Uh, I guess with the question of why do they leave all of this comfort, to what extent is it so comfortable for these individuals themselves is, is what they express in their writings. So uh, the question is how comfortable is, are they as citizens of these countries um, that led them to basically see it or have this imagination of Daesh as a utopia, as an answer to all of this discomfort. So the question is, what is this discomfort that, that is uh, present and unspoken of? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is, is for the panel, in fact. Uh, it is through the internet and the social media means. Uh, can we, in fact, uh, uh, make it a criminal act for conveying messages not linked to uh, ec uh, extremism, but, uh, sorry, to terrorism, but to extremism? I mean, the law today is, in many countries, in fact, don't, uh, don't uh, you know, uh, make it uh, a criminal to convey messages during, uh, uh, messages through this me media, uh, uh, you know, through the, the media uh, without, without, without really uh, having these laws. It's very difficult to, to, uh, to eliminate these uh, acts from our societies. Thank you. George, do you want to? Yeah, because this is a very important question, actually, because the difference between the policy framework and the legal uh, framework and the laws that are in currently in place. So let me tell you that, yes, uh, we, we, as Twitter, we are not in place to, uh, uh, to advise governments and lawmakers on, on what laws uh, need to to be in place, but at the same time, we are working in, in, in cooperation with, with uh, law enforcement agencies to receive uh, requests that 
sometimes that are emergency requests and sometimes that are Ill illegal uh, content as per national laws. And our, our dedicated team of experts reviews this sort of request in alignment of our global uh, terms of services and we act accordingly. And w uh, over the last period since I've, I've joined Twitter, I've, I've really seen a very positive impact on, on, on uh, cases uh, uh, that um, especially producing uh, terrorist uh, content. So it's, it's very valid. Uh, we, we encourage uh, 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 the review. We at Twitter, we are, it's, it's an incremental process. We, we are reviewing our policies and we are uh, open to uh, community uh, comments and input to make sure that it is uh, fitting whatever uh, the global community is, is facing. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take one more question. I know that a lot of people have questions, and it was a pretty popular panel, but we're trying to catch up with the time, so f feel free to stop the panelists from eating their lunch and just ask them all your questions. I'm going to take the last question from, um, yes, ma'am, right here. Yes. Shukran, uh, thank you. Tsang Kitwi Min Al Imarat. I think that the Mufrud Al البانل تركز على الأدوات اللي تستخدمها الجماعات الإرهابية هنا مفارقة بين جماعة متخلفة فكريا تستخدم أحدث الأساليب الرقمية أو التكنولوجية ويجب أن وإحنا نحلل أن لا نقطع الصلاة أن أن داعش هي الطور الآخر المتطور للقاعدة التي كانت أيضا تستخدم أساليب تكنولوجية متطورة منها أحداث سبتمبر وما إليه لأن كانت تستقطب يعني الآن الكلام عن الاستقطاب داعش كانت تستقطب المهندسين الأطباء المتعلمين تعليما عاليا وهذا أيضا يطرح سؤال لماذا هذه الجماعات تستقطب المتعلمين تعليما عاليا وهنا أنا أعرض مثال لسيد نيومن فتاة بلجيكية ومسيحية وأنا هذه القصة حكت لي إياها دبلوماسية تعمل لدينا في السفارة في بلجيكا غابت ستة أشهر ثم بعد ستة أشهر بعثت لصديقتها رسالة أنا مع داعش نعم لقد فقدت حريتي ولكن لي دخل لقد كنت تعلمين أنني طوال سنتين أبحث عن عمل رغم أنني حاصلة على تو ماسترز ولكن لم أكن أجد عملا ولقد تحولت إلى الإسلام فالقول أن الـ 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 هو فقط بعدم الإنكلوجة نشكر مستر نيومان أنا كنت في من سنتين في أوروبا وفي بلجيكا بالذات وكان مسألة عدم الاندماج غير مطروحة من الجانب الأوروبي أن السبب السياسات عدم الإدماج الأوروبية هي التي تسببت في هذا الركروتمنت من جانب أوروبا بالإضافة إلى أن أيضا أوروبا مسؤولة عن شيء آخر أي نعم هو من زاوية حقوق الإنسان أنا كنت في في أوسلو وعلى مقهى التقينا بشخص قال أنا هنا أقابل العائدين من داعش أي أنهم كانوا يخرجون ويدخلون تحت سمع وأنظار السلطات الأوروبية ولم يكن هناك من يقفهم إذا هي المسألة ليست فقط أن نحن في هذه المنطقة المصدرون ل الإرهاب الإرهاب ظاهرة عالمية تختلف جذورها من منطقة إلى أخرى ولكن هناك شباب عندما يحس أنه بلا مستقبل والأمر الأخير الذي أود أن نطرحه في الخلاصة أيضا أن لم يشر أي منهم إلى الألعاب الإلكترونية أنا عندما أفتح أي آب أفاجأ بلعبة إلكترونية عنيفة هذا ما الذي يدفع النش نفسه إلى العنف نحن اليوم لسنا في عالم التواصل الاجتماعي نحن في عالم التقاطع الاجتماعي كل منا 
يجلس في زاوية ولا يتحدث مع الجالس بجواره بقدر ما يتحدث مع الـ 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 الآلة التي في يديه شكرا لك شكرا Yeah, I just, do you want to respond to maybe about the use of these I, just, I wanted to just respond to this uh, just very quickly. Um, uh, and not necessarily in, in my academic capacity, but as someone who is a British Muslim, a European Muslim who's living this experience um, you know, for, 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 for quite a while. Um, this has been said in, in, in a few of the comments, actually, but you know, there is, of course, uh, pressures on European Muslims in terms of our identity, in terms of where we are as a community, uh, uh, whether it's in our immediate localities, for example, in my case in Britain, or whether it's more continental across uh, uh, Europe as a whole. There are definitely pressures on us, but we also need to be quite introspective as well, which is we're not doing enough of, I think, in, in Europe in particular, in terms of what is our role as a European uh, Muslim community? How do we work with and integrate with and operate within the societies that we are ultimately uh, part and parcel of because to be a Muslim in Britain is different to be a Muslim in Saudi or Qatar or Kuwait or in, in, in this region or to be a Muslim in Indonesia is different uh, than to be a Muslim in Europe. So as much as there are pressures on us uh, uh, as well, we can't abrogate all of our responsibility onto the state or onto the uh, community itself as well. We have to, within our communities, address some of the dis uh, discussion and discourse that takes place, which tells us, uh, and I was, you know, was young uh, when I, when I uh, moved uh, to Britain, that tells us, you know, you shouldn't integrate into the society, you shouldn't be part of it. This is Darul Kufr, this is Darul Harb, this is nothing to do with you. Um, and we need to address some of that as well within ourselves and within our own community, so we can build a, a positive a relationship with the societies in which we ultimately now find ourselves. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Shiraz. Thank you, everyone, for, for participating and for holding your questions. If you didn't get to ask them, I'm sure everyone's hungry now. Now it's lunch, yeah? All right, yeah, it's lunchtime, so eat. <laughs>